Good morning. Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I'm the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. If you'd like to stop by and visit us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh for our Sunday morning worship period that begins at 10. You can also get there an hour early at 9 and join us for our Bible classes, as well as our 4 p.m. worship service uh, later on in the day if that's more convenient for you. By the way, you can also find us at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays in the same location for the other half of our Bible Bible studies each week. We have classes for all ages. Feel free to reach out and get in contact with us by phone 812-550-6234 or email info at riverridgechurch.org. I mean, we'd love to take your comments, your questions, your feedback. I also encourage you to check out our radio show every week on Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. on 98.5 FM as well as 1400 AM for those of you who are a bit farther out. And our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash River Ridge Church of Christ, which has all of our past TV programs once they have aired, and also the uh, weekly live-streamed worship services and uh, Bible studies every time the church assembles. You're welcome to join us for those online, even if you can't be with us in person. I've mentioned before on the show that our yearly theme here at River Ridge has been focused on the family because we have a lot of families and, well, it's something that everybody needs to look at right now. And so I've been uh, sort of taking you along on that journey and uh, giving the, the lessons that I have pre- presented to the congregation, I've been presenting them on the, uh, the TV show a week or two afterward. Which, by the way, gets to another point that uh, a lot of times people assume that the lessons they hear me preach on TV are the same lessons that I preach that day at church. Almost never. I think I've done that twice, maybe three times in the several years that I've been doing this, but in any case, there's a lot more material available than just that. Uh, But nevertheless, I've been going back and trying to at least let you guys follow along with what we have been doing in the congregation. So far, we have looked at the individual roles of men and women, and children as well. Now, I want us to look at how two of these roles mesh. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. What did God want the animals that he had just created to do? Be fruitful and multiply. How? He doesn't get into the uh, nitty-gritty details of it here, and I can't really get into the nitty-gritty details of it uh, necessarily on the show here, uh, either for the sake of embarrassment or maybe the FCC would have something to say about it. I don't know. But uh, obviously we're, we're dealing with a male and a female of the species, and that's how these animals are going to reproduce. In fact, that's how most plants reproduce. If we go back to uh, the third day in Genesis chapter 1 still, verse 11, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. I love the number of times that he emphasizes the the seed and the fruit. I mean, if we just go back to verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit. I guess we didn't get that from the fact that they're fruit trees. Uh, Fruit in which is their seed, uh, in case case we were confused about that as well, each according to its kind on the earth. And then this, this same thing essentially is repeated again in verse 12. The earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And if we think about how this fruit is born, we could look at the anatomy of a flower here. And granted, it's not, not every single flower looks exactly like this, but now you can see that there is a, a basically male organ and there is a basically female organ. There is one part of the flower that is producing uh, something analogous to a, an egg, and then there is something that is more analogous to a sperm on the other side. 
and so the, the the male portion of the flower is is producing the uh, the well the seed to use the Hebrew and Greek terminology that will then uh, be deposited in the the female portion of the flower and that is of course in the in the in the form of pollen and that then will lead to further reproduction. And of course, it doesn't have to be all within the same flower. They can pollinate themselves, but they can also cross-pollinate with other plants, and that's actually more beneficial in most respects. You can even see some terminology here that uh, you might recognize, or at least that hints at what we're talking about. The, 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 the male portion of the flower is called the stamen, and the female portion is called the pistil. And uh, within, that, within that pistil, you can see a word like ovary, women have those. It's not exactly the same thing, but uh, you can see why the one was named that after the other. They they both perform a very similar function. And then you've also got, uh, within the, the base of the pistil, you've got ovules, which uh, roughly translating directly from Latin, you've got little eggy thing. There, there we go again. There is an egg uh, or something very, very close to it within the uh, the flower, and that's part of its reproductive process. And then, of course, on the male side, you've got this stamen, and uh, within that, you see these, these tiny little balls, or what we would call pollen, and those are created in the microsporangium, which, uh, so uh, micro, you've got little, and sporangium, seed vessel. It's tied to the word for sperm, in fact. They both come from the same ancient Greek root. So you've got a very clear female and male portion of this flower so it can continue on reproducing. And we can see how Moses was really focusing on the aspect of reproduction even as God is creating the, the very first generation of these plants. Let's continue on in verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. This continues the theme of abundant life that we see throughout the creation narrative here in Genesis 1 all different kinds of, of creatures that God is creating. It's not just that God created uh, one creature and he wanted it to only ever be that way. No, rather he, he created an abundance of different, of, of diverse species to populate this, this incredible globe that we inhabit. Each one is supposed to reproduce according to its kind, and that gives us a plan for the future, which is, I suppose we could sum it up in saying, make more that look like you. Be fruitful and multiply. Let's read on. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man in his own image, in the image of God who created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what characterized his creation of humans? Well, a lot of things were the same, but one of them was different. It was that humans were created in God's image. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that just like God, humans have two eyes and two ears, but only one nose and one mouth? No, that it has nothing to do with that. It's not about physical appearance. It's not about physical anything because God is not a physical being. He's a spiritual being, as Jesus himself tells us in John 4. God is spirit. So it's not about the, the, the physical manifestation or the physical appearance, let alone. Rather, it's about the, the metaphysical likeness. Things like an independent moral will. There's a spark of the divine in man which differentiates man from the other animals. Man is supposed to have dominion over the rest of creation as a result of this. Man is presented as the pinnacle of God's creation here in Genesis 1. The most text is devoted to the creation of man rather than, you know, the beasts of the earth or the, the fish of the sea or, or the plants of the field or anything like that. No, it's focused on man. He's the final achievement. He's supposed to be the, the top of the hierarchy. And after creating man, that's when God stops. He rests on the seventh day. 
So those are important, the image of God, the dominion, uh, the, the, the pinnacle. But there's another thing that characterizes the creation of man that is just as important. Male and female, he created them. And they were instructed to be fruitful and multiply. This was actually the first commandment that was given to man. And it's also a uh, commandment of sorts that was given to the, the, the birds and the fish back on day five, you remember. Be fruitful and multiply. But of course, they don't have any moral culpability, and yet they don't seem to have any problem with being fruitful and multiplying, except for some weird cases like pandas. So... In that case, it seems obvious that God is, you know, perhaps uh, while he says to them, be fruitful and multiply, he's not saying, or I'm going to condemn you to hell if you disobey me. Rather, when he says, be fruitful and multiply, it's that he is building into these animals an innate desire to reproduce. And he has done that with man as well. The sexual difference is fundamental to humanity. Both male and female are made in the image of God. But man is divided into two halves, so to speak. However, while this tells us the, the broad summary of the creation of humanity in the context of the rest of God's creation, we're also brought into the middle of the story in chapter 2. Let's pick up there in verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Something's missing here, don't you think? Jump down to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So, when exactly did God discover that Adam was incomplete? Well, that's a silly question. This is God we're talking about. Obviously, he knew from the start that Adam was incomplete and needed a mate. Of every living thing that God created to reproduce sexually, all of the animals that we talked about before, even most of the plants, for which of those did he just forget to make one sex? None of them. They were all ready to go. So did he just forget that Adam was going to need an Eve? And if not, then why did he make Adam alone? The only thing out of all of his creation that he declared to be not good. Everything else, he created it and he said, this is good, and then he moved on to the next thing. In this case, he created man without woman and said it's not good that he is alone. Well, if he knows that, why didn't he just create Eve in the first place? Well, the reason that he does this sort of thing is to teach us lessons. To teach Adam lessons, to teach Eve lessons for that matter, and even to teach us lessons. The idea is, Adam, Eve, you two need each other. You can exist independently. You can do worthwhile things. Sometimes being alone can actually be an asset. We look at uh, the Apostle Paul, who was single for his entire life. He talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about how that actually works out to help him accomplish a lot of work for the kingdom of heaven. In verse 7, he says, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But he recognizes that not everybody can do that and that not everybody should do that in all circumstances. That was for that present time and for a specific purpose. Later on in verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. 
Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 19 spoke about this when he said, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. That is a good thing to do for those who can bear it. But most people can't bear it. And regardless of a few exceptional cases, broadly speaking and in the abstract, an independent male or an independent female cannot fulfill humanity's core purpose, which is not just to propagate life, but to love and propagate life. Let's read on. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed." Why didn't God make Eve out of the dust like he had made Adam out of the dust? Or why didn't he just, for that matter, speak both of them into existence like he did everything else, just out of the void? Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be Adam, and there was Adam. But that's not how he did it. Adam is made out of the dust. And that helps us to gain a, a visceral understanding of man's connection to the earth, the ground. That's where we get our food. That's the, the, the matter of which our bodies are composed. It's not the whole of our existence, of course, but it is a beautifully simple demonstration of our incarnation, despite the fact that we are primarily metaphysical or spiritual beings. Okay, so that helps us a bit with Adam, made out of the dust of the ground. What about Eve, made out of Adam's rib? Well, just like there's a visceral understanding of man's connection to the earth, there's a visceral understanding of woman's connection to man. As Adam said, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, it's easy to see that in the opposite direction via childbirth, because every single male comes out of a woman's body. But it's not so easy for us to see it in the opposite direction, and yet it's important for us to recognize that it is so. It is both true and proper that just as man is not independent of woman, woman is not independent of man either. Each nature requires the other. And what was the moral imperative that Moses took from the manner of Adam and Eve's creation? That's what we read in verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. As a sidebar on this, why does it bear mentioning that they were naked and unashamed? Well, we know to be ashamed of our nakedness to some extent or another. Why is this? Because all of our vulnerabilities and imperfections would be on display. That includes sexual organs, which most other animals form somewhat conceals and shelters, at least most of the time. But for us, eh, it doesn't work that way. But between a man and his wife, that's not supposed to matter. It shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter. They are one flesh. My imperfections, the things that I might be ashamed of, they belong to my wife. They are her imperfections too. And so she doesn't have any reason to, uh, you know, to hold those against me because if, it's, if I'm vulnerable, then she's vulnerable. And of course, my wife has no imperfections. But if she did, do you think there's any chance I would tell you about them? They would be my business, not yours. So from here in Genesis 1, the creation of Adam and Eve, Let's jump forward to Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This is a difficult thing to do, and we've hit on this text several times over the course of this series already. Wives are expected to surrender their, their will and themselves to their husbands. They're supposed to trust their husbands and respect their husbands. That is not an easy thing to do when you take into consideration how imperfect all of the husbands are. That's something to think about when choosing a husband, by the way. Try to look beneath the surface at the heart as God does 
There's a great illustration of this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where uh, God has sent Samuel to anoint a new king after having rejected Saul. And of course, we know that that's going to be David, but Samuel doesn't know it yet. And so he's told to look through several of this man Jesse's sons. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And it's difficult to tell, but there is plenty that will come up to the surface that indicates what's in the heart if you're willing to look for it. But we're not done with that. It's not only wives who have responsibilities, so do husbands. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body." It's easy to get lost here in the transition to Christ and the church, but think about the husbands and wives. He tells husbands, love your wives. Notice, he didn't say, fall in love with your wives. That happens. It, it, it's great when it does. But regardless, even if it doesn't, it is a responsibility, not a happy accident, to love your wife. Another point is that love your wife does not mean make your wife happy. Often it will work out that way, but if she wants something that's not good for her, loving your own flesh does not mean giving it whatever it wants. In fact, often it means giving it, well, it means denying it things, denying your body too much food, denying your body the wrong type of food, and spurring your body to do difficult and even painful physical activity because it's what's good for you. We all know that. Do you expect loving your wife to be completely different? The comparison that Paul used here was, no man ever hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it. So do that with your wife as well. It's a big responsibility. So from here, Paul brings it back to Genesis, verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So let's zoom out. We've got a lot of different things going on here. We've got Adam and Eve. We've got uh, wives submit to your husbands. We've got husbands love your wives. We've got this whole thing about Christ and the church. Okay, back up. What did Paul say here? This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What? mystery. The mystery that he just expressed in the previous verse, 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So how does that refer to Christ in the church exactly? From the start, when God created and instructed the husband and wife, it was always about Christ in the church. It's not that God established the church and then he thought, hey, you know it would be a really good analogy, a great way for these people to understand the proper relationship between Christ and the church? No, it was the other way around. He created us with this in mind. Husbands, apply this knowledge in your marriage and it will be much easier It'll be much easier for your wife to submit, and it'll be much easier for you to lead your household properly, because you are representing Christ in that union. Still not easy, because it's about self-sacrifice, and you don't always get to rest when you need it. All those sorts of things, the things that Jesus himself suffered, but easier. Wives, apply this knowledge in your marriage, and it will be easier. It'll be easier for him to love you and to lead you, and it'll be easier for you to trust and submit to him. Still not easy, just like it's not easy for the church to deny its own will, it's not going to be easier for you to deny your will. You're not always going to agree with your husband, and unlike the situation with the church and Christ, sometimes your husband is going to make mistakes. But 
it'll be easier. And if you'll both do this, if the wife will imitate the church as it should be, and if the husband will imitate Christ as he is, then you're both going to take very good care of each other. And the blessings will abound, including abundant life, both in this temporal world and for eternity. This leads to the creation of many more children, this love and propagation of life. And it's not just creating children and then throwing them out into the world and saying, well, we don't care about these. Rather, it is creating new lives and then nurturing them as God nurtured us and teaching them to become a part of God's big family as we are. This is an eternal family. But it all starts with becoming a part of Christ's bride, the church. And as long as we're in Ephesians 5 here, let's reread verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. As husbands, we are supposed to represent Christ, we are supposed to imitate Christ, but we're just not him. And it would be presumptuous of us to pretend that we are perfect and that it's our job to cleanse and purify our wives. No, that's not the way that it works. We're doing a pretty good job if we can do a little bit of nurturing and cherishing, and if we can uh, portray Christ's love to them, and if we can engage in a similar type of daily self-sacrifice. It's not just, I'd be willing to take a bullet for her, but rather, I'm giving up on my desires daily and doing what she needs instead. Not just dedicating my death to her, so to speak, but giving up my life for her. That's what we're supposed to do. But Christ goes even beyond that for the church. The church is cleansed and purified and sanctified and presented to him. But how can the church look like that if her constituent members are filthy and defiled and covered in spots and wrinkles and blemishes? How can the church submit to her husband, Christ, if her constituent members all go their own way and do what they want instead. As John says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And so I ask you, are you one of His? Do you abide in His teaching? Have you been washed and sanctified? Do you belong in his house? Do you fit with him as male and female go together? If not, then get in touch with us at River Ridge and we can go through that process of changing this problem with you. You can call us or text us at 812-550-6234 or email us at info at riverridgechurch.org. You can also find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. We gather at 9 a.m. every Sunday for Bible study, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. for worship, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another study. I'd love to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.